Good evening, citizens of Gotham and all the ships at sea. Back in 1998, 20 years ago, I wrote the first draft of a screenplay for The Trial of John Peter Zenger. A few drafts later, I sent numerous query letters to agents and entered a number of contests also, none of which were interested in this uh, piece I'd written. Mostly the, the uh, excuse they gave was because Amistad uh, failed to bring in expected numbers. The late 1990s, uh, if you remember, well, even into the early 2000s, was not a good time for true history. Uh, this era was uh, known more for gross-out comedies, found footage films, anything with Nicole Kimmon and um, Colin Farrell and a few franchise beginnings. The stage play and this novel version here really didn't do any better. There was just not an audience for pre-revolutionary war media. Well, not with my name on it anyway. So, here we are two decades later with YouTube as the media distribution service of those who would otherwise never be heard from. And I will be reading you my novel of the trial of John Peter Zenger. Now we begin in the past tense in the year 1710 when John Peter Zenger was just a boy. Uh, it, when he uh, is in adulthood, I will be reading to you in the present tense. The reason for uh, reading to you in the present tense is to put you in the moment with these real-life revolutionaries who back in, the, uh, back in 1734, 35, were hoping to litigate for their freedom from the crown rather than risk citywide massacres. Now, remember that in the time this story takes place, America was a British colony. There was no freedom of speech. There was no freedom of assembly. Commerce was very restrictive. And you could either get a swimming lesson with rocks in your pockets or just get blown away at any time. This is 40 years before the Sons of Liberty, Johnny Tremaine, and much of what you learned about in grade school. So begins the lesson. Chapter 1. We're beginning in the fall of the year 1710. Storm clouds advance over the mountain peaks, shadowing uh, the small hamlet in the valley of the German Rhenish Palatinate below. Moving south at a gallop, a platoon of British cavalry maneuver on the base of a mountain and enter the valley along a dirt trail. Theirs is a mission carried out frequently in this zone, currently under rule of the British Crown. The Crown needs subjects uh, to man their interests in the colonies and uprooting entire towns and moving their populations across the Atlantic has become the method of attaining that end. The British Union Jack flutters stiffly in the breeze above a Black Eagle flag atop a market building in the Walkplatz. Citizens of this tiny hamlet move from shop to shop conducting the day's commerce. Many of their younger children run about the fountain at play while their elder siblings mimic the uh, activities of their parents as they learn to shop and manage the family finances. These are a simple people, shopkeepers, farmers, craftsmen, so forth. Gently breaking in half his large pretzel, 13-year-old John Peter Zenger gives half to his blushing girlfriend, Ingrid. She thanks him with her smile, and he gently grips her hand as she takes a small bite out of the pretzel. These are the simple moments in one's formative years that are hopefully not forgotten during the tribulations of later life. Noticing their son in the distance are his parents, who were in their late 30s and have been shopping for the week's groceries of wheat, flour, barley, rice, bottled sauces, and fresh vegetables. Seeing their son with Ingrid conjures their formative memories in a place not too different from this one half a lifetime away. Riding at the fore of his men, the British captain holds up his hand, signaling his men to reduce their speed. He points left, then right, indicating that first and second platoons will break left, third and fourth should break right, and surround the hamlet. While they're encircling the hamlet, none of them has yet pulled a pistol or taken hold of their shoulder rifles. They know that with winter's approach, the population of this hamlet will face considerable hardships and perhaps loss of life as they do every year. 
They do not want to approach in anger or be seen as aggressing. While this might seem uncommon for an armed platoon, their mission is to offer the possibility of a new life. Rumor might have traveled faster than the cavalry because a number of hamlets have already vacated in the past months, and all with little or no resistance. At the blacksmith's shop, Mr. Zenger is examining the fine workmanship on a set of horseshoes while Mrs. Zenger selects a fireplace pole for bellows. She glances through the diamond-shaped windows to see her two younger children, a son and daughter, running around the fountain. Further across the walk plot, she sees John and Ingrid eating the pretzel and talking to the bakery. Hearing the jingle of coins, she looks back into the shop to see her husband purchasing the horseshoes. They exit the shop together and head across the walk plots to the butcher's shop. Faintly, they can hear the approach of horses, yet looking up and down the street and through the alleys, they see nothing is yet approaching them. Maneuvering his horse down a narrow street, the middle-aged platoon leader gestures to his men to converge on the walk plots beyond. Since having surrounded the entire hamlet, they had seen no one regarding them with hostility. In fact, little notice was taken of them at all. This was a noticeable difference from trotting into Scotland, Ireland, or India, where the very sight of one red-coated cavalryman was enough to incite a riot among the indigenous population. Hearing the distant clip-clopping, Mr. Zenger turns to see a red coat on a horse moving through a nearby alley. The thundering of clouds caused the children to stop playing around the fountain, then a loud rumbling echoes in from an adjacent street. Turning toward the sound of rumbling, John Peter Zenger grabs Ingrid by the arm and pulls her up against the bakery, just as a cavalryman on horseback charges by, narrowly missing the two of them by inches. Following only two seconds behind, the first horse is the British Colonel, atop his dark horse who then enters the walk plots and comes to a stop near the fountain. The colonel dismounts his horse and stands on the ledge of the fountain, regarding the citizens that stand around him. They seem to have a nervous anticipation as he reaches into his coat, pulls out a parchment, and unrolls it. Citizens of the British palace tonight, reads the British colonel, as colonial subjects of the British Crown, you are hereby commanded by Her Majesty, Queen Anne, to vacate this land. You were born ship and be taken to the colonial Americas for the purpose of expanding the British Empire. The Crown understands your time of transition will be difficult. As such, Her Majesty extends her blessings to you and wishes you well in your new life. My men will aid you as best we can with any questions and support. God save the Queen. Instantly there are exchanged glances and the voicing of displeasure in low tones among the townspeople. Having delivered his message, the British Colonel mounts his horse and rides out of town. Over a dozen redcoats with shouldered muskets enter the walk plots, but show none of their usual frigid demeanor. They simply walk about meeting the townspeople and assuring them all was for the best. This was uh, all uncommon to what the townspeople expected. Stepping out of the alcove, Ingrid stands beside John Peter Zenger, who stares down the block to watch the British colonel riding off. Jody, why are they doing this? Because they can, replies John Peter Zenger as he looks up to the Union Jack fluttering above in the breeze. The storm clouds roll in fast, only to be lacerated by a lightning bolt that angrily illuminates the sky. Chapter 2 A tattered Union Jack holds onto the mizzen mast by only threads as the winds blow the rain sideways and the lightning erupts the darkness. The old cargo frigate is struck amidships by a tidal wave and nearly capsized. Water seeps over the weather deck, nearly wiping the crew into the frigid North Atlantic. 
Waves rise above the frigate's masts, crests, and then plunge down, causing the ship to be tossed, dropped, and shoved about like a toy. Grabbing a hammer, Mrs. Zenger pounds a nail into a thick plank of wood, securing it to the bulkhead. Mr. Zenger shoves, a, shoves two four by six foot cargo doors closed and holds them while Mrs. Zenger swings to the other side of the wood plank over one cargo door and holds it in place. She looks back to her firstborn, John Peter Zenger, as he rushes to the full on fallen toolkit. Johnny, grab the other hammer, yells Mrs. Zenger as a wave strikes the ship. Water bleeds through the doors and drenches both she and Mr. Zenger. Running over the rolling deck with hammer in hand, John Peter Zenger stands to the left of his father, grabs a nail from his pocket, and drives it into the, the plank of wood. Another wave strikes the ship hard, but this time very little water seeps through the gaps around the cargo doors. Smiling, Mr. Zenger puts his arm around his wife and son, smacks their shoulders. A wave strikes the ship from ahead, causing uh, it to rise up and throw everyone not secured, back toward the aft. Several startled children and adults grab the hanging nets and skeletal beams for stability, but many more are sent tumbling aft. Gaining their footing, two burly British sailors drive nails into a uh, flat board sealing tight the overhead cargo bay doors. They look to the port side to see the double hatch secured with a long board nailed on either side. Hey, how'd you steal that hatch? inquires one sailor. Mr. Zenger glances to his wife and three children and smiles, Quanta del Hell. The two sailors exchange glances and then look aft to see numerous other families cowering for cover beneath wooden tables toward the aft of the cargo compartment. On the weather deck, the boatswain uh, grabs a railing as a wall of water sweeps over the ship, sending two of his men tumbling backwards. They both grab the thin mass and hold on for dear life as the ship turns itself upright again. The captain and the petty officer spread across the deck to the wheel and roll it hard to the left. In reaction, the ship pivots to port toward an oncoming wave that strikes the forecastle, shoves the ship's nose up, and washes over the deck. Several of the upper masts are snapped by the 80 mile an hour, 80 knot wind and rain causing the sails to stream and then fall towards the ocean. It would not take long for the waterlogged sails to endanger the ship further. Below, in the cargo deck, the boatswain can be heard running across the weather deck to the mast. Damn it! Drop the sails! We're capsizing! Shoving his younger brother and sister under a table, John Peter Zenger looks across the deck to see his parents grabbing the ceiling beams while the ship rolls violently. Without warning, another wave slams the forecastle, causing the front of the uh, ship to lurch suddenly upward and spill everyone off their feet on the ground. Mrs. Zenger struggles to keep her feet on the deck and looks sideways to see her son John sliding on his stomach down the wet deck. The 13-year-old grabs hold of a cargo net with his left hand and lurches to a sudden halt. Seeing a small child screaming and flailing down the deck toward him, John reaches out with his right hand, grabs the child's jacket, and yanks him to a stop. His, hand, his hands already full, John Peter Zenger can do nothing about the screaming woman who tumbles past him down the deck, strikes several barrels, rope to the bulkhead. Mrs. Zenger looks to her husband and sees him drenched to the skin, yet smiling. And what are you smiling about, she inquires. Did you ever feel more alive? Asked Mr. Zenger in a robust voice. Miss, Mrs. Zenger looks down the cargo bay at her three children, then back at her husband's smiling face as another wave strikes and jolts the ship. Yeah, three times. <laughs> Mr. Zenger laughs while the ship is struck amidships again. Hearing a loud squeak, he looks forward to the forecastle to see the doors open. And a wall of water roll in as the bosun slides down the railing and stomps on the wet deck. I can use another hand topside, yells the bosun as he looks around the deck to see passengers vomiting and nursing sprains. Mr. Zenger looks down the deck to see a family praying as another wave strikes the ship. 
and sends them grabbing the bolted down the table for stability. How can I help, Herr Bolson? The sails are streaming, announces the Bolson. We cut them loose and we capsize. This is Inger do her husband to be an able man, but uh, not trained as a sailor. Letting him go up on that weather deck, just not a good idea. Where do you think you're going? What do you think you're doing? Whatever I can, Johanna, replies Mr. Zinger. He kisses his wife. He kisses his wife and then uh, turns to his firstborn son, John. Son, take care of the shop until I return. Looking to his younger siblings, John Peter Zinger nods to his father. Mrs. Zinger stands there trying to hide the shock as she watches her husband grab the rope rails and descend the steps with the bosun to the weather deck above. John Peter Zenger had wanted to say something to his father, but at the moment, nothing came to mind. Torn loose and streaming off the starboard side of the frigate, the sails dropped into the ocean and quickly soak up water. Within minutes, the ship would capsize. Within two minutes of that, every person dumped in the North Atlantic would be shivering in the convulsions while their heart rate skyrocketed but their body temperatures plummeted. Two minutes later, They'd be frozen to death. Clenching the large knives in their teeth, the bosun and Mr. Zengu climb hand over hand up the netting toward the upper visit mast. A tattered sail streaming from the mast whips side to side, nearly knocking the two men from the netting. Mr. Zengu had never scaled the ship's netting before. In fact, he'd never been to sea before. And the fact that his life was so overwhelmingly threatened and that so many other lives relied on him excited him to no end. He knew his purpose in life was providing for his family, yet this moment provided a moment of clarity, the sense of purpose beyond all he felt ever before. It was as if this was the critical moment in life. This was the reason he'd been born. Wrapping a rope around several barrels, John Peter Zenger secures him to a support beam near the bulkhead. He glances at his brother and sister, kneeling under a table, and then to the cargo doors where water bleeds through every time a wave strikes a midships. Nearby, a six-foot-tall pole is lifted by Mrs. Zenger and two sailors in position upright to support a cracked ceiling beam that threatens to give way. Steadying his feet again on the rope, Mr. Zenger curls his left arm around the upper mizzen mast and stabilizes himself. The hard freezing rains had soaked him to the skin before he even made it up to the upper mast, and the winds have him shivering uncontrollably. He felt frigid cold before and knew how debilitating it was, yet he was in no way hindered at this moment. He sidesteps along the rope until he reaches the halyards. Torn sails are streamed down into the ocean below. With his knife held tightly in his right hand, he slashes at the sail till it cuts it loose and watches it fly back on the strong winds and plunge into the ocean. Looking left, he sees the bosun, two sailors half his own age, slice away another streaming sail and cast it into the dark night's murky depths. The ship is going upright, howls the bosun. Mr. Zenger looks down at the starboard side of the ship to see the flank rising sideways out of the water. He looks back behind him to see the captain roll the wheel hard left and stabilize the ship. The captain looks straight up at him and gives him a long arm gesture as if signaling to get down quickly. Mr. Zenger sidesteps along the rope. Past the halyard toward the net rigging, and could already see the boats and the two sailors descending it quickly. Rapidly descending the vertical net rigging, the boatswain's eye is caught by a wave rising ominously over it. He looks up to Mr. Zenger to see him still climbing down, apparently oblivious to the wave lunging in behind him. Wave! Howls the boatswain.
Boson. Faintly hearing the Boson's word, Mr. Zenger rapidly looks around and sees the wall of water plunging down at him. He confronts it with a wild smile and wraps his arm tightly around the vertical netting. The wave strikes the ship hard midships, throwing it 90 degrees over until its cracked masts nearly strike the rolling sea below. The impact of the wave blasts the 4x6 cargo doors wide open and thousands of gallons of frigid ocean blast in. Slammed against the bulkhead, John Peter Zenger grabs a cargo net and can only watch as several screaming passengers are washed off the deck and out to sea. They struggle against the chopping current to swim back to the listing ship only to be carried further into the darkness by another wave. He looks to the aft and is unable to see his family as the water rebounds and fills the cargo deck. Then, pulling the heads of his sister and brother above the rolling water, he sees his mother holding on to the rope he previously secured the barrels with. His ears faintly hear the screams as they are filled with water. And he can only wonder how many more waves it would have to take to fill the ship's lower cargo decks and finally send everyone to a drowning death. He looks back through the open cargo deck doors to faintly see washed out passengers convulsing on the waves and inevitably sinking beneath them. He honestly thought he would have lived longer. A frayed rope tied from the base of the wheel was the only thing secured around the captain's waist that prevented his being washed off the uh, washed off to a drowning death. He crawls up the tilted deck, grabs the wheel, and rolls it fast to the left. But filled with water as the ship is, it was not riding itself quickly enough. He'd seen several passengers drown a moment ago and knew they'd have plenty of company unless the storm let up soon. Looking skyward, he sees the clouds billowing by at high speed and then notices the first dots of starlight. Jumping from the vertical netting, the bosun lands hard on the listing deck, grabs the seller by the arm and stands him upright. He looks around but cannot see Mr. Sanger at all. In the distance, he sees that one of the lifeboats that has been torn loose from its fittings, instinctively he moves toward it tilts it, but did not see Mr. Zenger beneath it. Somehow, he knew he should not expect to but the hope for the family man's survival weighing heavily upon him. Mr. Zenger, Mr. Zenger, sir, where are you? yells the bosun. Looking around the deck, the bosun can see several more sailors standing upright as the water rolls off them. He hopes that Mr. Zenger has not been washed out to sea but the possibility certainly exists. Tons of water roll down into the lower cargo deck causing the ship to drop lower and tilt upright. Passengers drenched to the skin and freezing cough out water and stagger to their feet. Looking left, John Peter Zenger sees his mother, brother, and sister struggling to stand upright among the exhausted passengers. Bob! Are you all right? asked Mrs. Zenger as she moves toward John. Mr. Zenger! Where are you, sir? shouts the bosun from the weather deck above. His footsteps can be heard moving over the deck quickly as if he were looking the entire length of the ship. Dad! John Peter Zenger rushes up the steps toward the forecastle door, followed by Mrs. Zenger. I found him, sir! Echoes the sound of his voice from the deck above. Reaching the forecastle door, John Peter Zenger pries at the locking latch. Having been struck and bent by the pressure of the water, the latch is warped and stuck in place. Mrs. Zenger reaches John and wraps her arms around him. Whatever is happening on the deck above, she does not want him seeing it. Oh, no! Comes the boss's voice. Mrs. Zenger's instincts immediately tell her what happened. She trembles and shakes her head while listening to the boots of sailors running across the deck. 
They all seem to stop in the same area as if looking over something very wrong. Doctor! Doctor to the weather deck at once, sir! Yells the boatswain. Belay that order, says the captain. He won't need the doctor. Her face twisting with dismay, Mrs. Anger sinks near the creaking steps, quietly sobs. John can only stand there, not knowing what to do. Storm's passing, Captain, announces the sailor. Lieutenant, take a bearing and put the ship back on course, orders the captain as he paces quickly. Gentlemen, gather what cloth you may and rig a mainsail. Ensign, prep the deck for services. I'll be below for a, I'll be below for a moment. More boot steps can be heard on the weather deck above, followed by the scraping sound of a heavy body being dragged and then lifted. Looking back, John Peter's anger sees the sympathetic and fatigued faces of his fellow surviving passengers. Hearing a creaking sound, he turns to the latch to see the latch tilt up and the forecastle door open. The captain moves tirely, heavily, down the steps and removes his water-drenched hat. He sees Mrs. Zenger trying to contain herself and can only wonder if his words will trigger the inevitable outburst of emotion that he'd seen too many times before, like this, on voyages like this. It never got any easier. Only more routine. Mrs. Zenger! The captain gently reaches down and takes hold of Mrs. Zenger's elbow and gently stands her up. She looks exhausted. Mrs. Zenger, I... Is he? The captain slowly nods. He saved the ship. I'm very sorry. Dazed by the emotional impact, Mrs. Zenger leans on John as he looks up to the captain. The captain glances to Mrs. Zenger then to the young ones, and then puts his hand down on John's shoulder. You are the firstborn? Yeah, yeah, yes, Captain, replies John Peter Zenger. You are the man of the family now, says the Captain. The water and wind had him cough and cold enough. Suddenly having to shoulder the burden of his father, Made him forget how to breathe. He nods slowly to the captain, and his mother breaks down sobbing. His brother and sister approach to provide her comfort, but John Peter Zenger, age 13, is standing there now, tasked with the welfare of the family. Coughing out water, he drags in a slow, deep breath. It is weeks later before the frigate lumbers into New York Harbor on sails made of torn shirts, jackets, and tattered canvas. The dead have been laid to rest at sea. The winter cold, the bad food, the dwindling water supply has left most on board sick, unclean, debilitated. The ship is no longer in any condition to be repaired and will never brave the North Atlantic Ocean ever again. The crew will be broken up and portioned out to surviving ships. The passengers will be processed as per procedure, and many will endure over a decade of indentured servitude. They remain subjects of the British crown, with little, look, little to look forward to, given the class they were born to, and few more rights than a prisoner. But this is America. Chapter 3, October 1734. The city had grown considerably over the island in 24 years, making the New York among the largest colonial cities in the British Empire. The harbor buzzed with the activity of fishing boats and commercial freighters moving in and out of the piers, but no vessel, large or small, 
went unseen by the crew of the muscular 60-gun warship that had a nasty habit of casting her shadow over anything that moved. This was indeed a city with a lid on it. Warships guarded the coasts. Fast, roving squads of redcoats policed the countrysides. And Sheriff John Symes patrolled New York City. At a general store on Nassau Street, a middle-aged merchant, Paul David Birch, put on his thick-rimmed glasses to regard the label on a bottle of rum before presenting it to a well-dressed restaurateur. Gently twisting away the cork, the restaurateur samples the scent of the rum, nods his approval, and corks the bottle. Mr. Birch takes the bottle and places it into the uh, back of a wooden case with five other bottles and then closes the case tight. Pedestrians along Nassau Street scurry into shops, side streets, and alleys as the burly Sheriff John Symes and three musket-toting redcoats march down the middle of the cobblestone street. Clenched in the sheriff's fist is a warrant for arrest. He stares straight down the block at the shop. He intends to invade this shop while the redcoats sweep their gaze side to side as if looking down on insects. For the sheriff, it was routine to begin the day with a half dozen arrests, which could often be done before breakfast. Customers in the general store are too occupied in their shopping to notice the ruckus outside. Mr. Birch is handed several guineas in coin by the restaurateur in payment for the case rum and is then recorded in the sales ledger. Carrying a basket of uh, bagged corn, tomatoes, and potatoes is Mr. Birch's wife, Mr. Birch's wife, Eloise, who is easily half his age. She hands the restaurateur the basket, and he responds with a nod and a smile before heading out the door. Without warning, the door swings open, and its glass panels are shattered against the wall. Startled, Eloise looks to the door and is eclipsed by the shadow of Jeriff John Symes as he storms into the store and knocks the restaurateur to the hardwood floor. The restaurateur barely has time to get his bearings before the sheriff walks right over him and maneuvers to the counter. Two middle-aged women scream as the rear door flings open and the three redcoats enter with fixed bayonets. They waste no time deploying themselves throughout the store and cutting off anyone's avenue of escape. Eloise watches as the sheriff stomps toward the counter and slams the warrant for arrest against the chest of her husband. Before she can gasp, the sheriff has shoved Mr. Birch up against the shelf and pinned him there. Stomping to his feet down on the floor, the restaurateur tries to stand, only to be shoved down on his ass by a fast-moving redcoat. To further punctuate the point, the redcoat stabs his bayonet through the restaurateur's long coat and smiles as if daring him to try to stand again. He then looks to his partner, who opens the wood box to reveal the six bottles of rum. Mr. Birch has no idea why the sheriff is slamming his head on the counter with one hand and is and examining his sales ledger with the other. Eloise can only scream, but is silenced by a hard stare from the sheriff. The customers stand there trembling as the redcoat sees the rum. And the sheriff strong arms Mr. Birch out of the store. None of them make contact with the passing Reds Coast, lest that be misinterpreted as being rebellious, which is enough to get you taken up, incarcerated for months, while the authorities fabricate charges to judge you guilty with. Curious pedestrians approach the general store to see what is happening, when the three Redcoats rush out, sweeping their muskets side to side, as if warning anyone against doing anything stupid, like heroism. 
The sheriff drags Mr. Birch out of the store wearing handcuffs and shackles and across the street, 15-year-old Peter Zenger, son of John Peter Zenger, stops walking to watch the arrest. He sees Eloise run out of the store screaming and lunge at the sheriff. Rolling his eyes as if annoyed, a red coat just slams the butt of his musket right into Eloise's stomach and sends her sprawling backwards to the cobblestones. She grabs her stomach, struggles to drag in her breath, and rise while the sheriff punches Mr. Birch several times in the face till he too drops to the cobblestones. The thick glasses fall from Mr. Birch's face and crack on the stones. Grabbing the leg chains, the sheriff drags Mr. Birch, bloody and dazed, up the middle of the street while the redcoats flank him. One of them carries the case of rum with the word evidence stenciled across the lid. Standing nearby in an alley with a smug smile on his face is Francis Harrison. He watches Peter Zenger drop his school books on the curb and run beside a large painter toward Eloise. They stand on either side of her and gently raise her to her feet. She sobs and struggles to breathe, causing Harrison more satisfaction. He is the sort of sadistic parasite who grew up pulling the legs off of insects and graduated into colonial politics. The kitchen in the Zenger apartment is a cramped room with a grill, counter, overhead cupboards to store bagged foods, plates and crockery. And a Zenger feeds three logs to the fire under the grill and then stirs the barley soup in the iron pot. She can hear the sound of thumping coming up the wooden stairs and turns to the door just in time to see it swing open. Her son Peter run in and slam the door closed behind him. Peter Zenger, snaps Anna. I told you not to slam the door. You'll chip the paint. Do you know how many blueberries are needed to make one pail of blue? Mom, Sheriff Symes came and took him away, shouts Peter. Took whom away? Beat him into the street and took him away. Beat who? asks Anna, Anna Zenger. What happened? The sheriff came, replies Peter. He, he arrested Mr. Birch and, and broke his glasses. And, and one of the soldiers hit Miss, Mrs. Birch and left her on the street. Did you tell your father? asks Anna as she tries to calm herself and plan her next move. No, Mom, I was delivering the papers on the way to school when... Anna grabs her long coat. We're going to the shop. Peter watches her grab a middle poker, shove the logs apart till the fire under the grill dies out, and then take the soup off the grill and place it on a ceramic plate. Open the door, let's go. Peter's or, Peter opens the door, and Anna tries to, to uh, place the poker against the grill. It falls to the floor, but she ignores it and sweeps out the door. He follows her out, closing the door behind him. <laughs> His years of indentured servitude had prepared John Peter Zenger, now age 37, <laughs> to manage his own newspaper, the New York Weekly Journal. He holds several handwritten articles and quickly arranges them in order before handing them off to his Irish journeyman. Runs a Lewis Morris editorial on page one, says John Peter Zenger. He has proof of his dispute with Lord Cornbury and, and Governor Cosby. Never wise to raise the ire of a Supreme Court Justice, notes the journeyman. Mr. Alexander is collecting the opinions on the street. The citizen is unhappy with Governor Cosby's policies. Never wise to anger the public, notes the journeyman. The front door opens, the bells jingle, and Anna briskly enters. At the doorway, Peter looks back to see if they were followed. Sees no one out there and follows his mother into the print shop. John, calls Anna. Hearing his wife's voice, John Peter Zenger steps out from behind the tall bookshelves that serve as his office cubicle. Instinct tells him that something is not right with her, as she did not typically come to the shop this early in the morning. Anna, what a pleasant surprise. John and Sheriff came for Mr. Birch. Peter saw them brutalize he and Eloise on the street. When? Not an hour ago, replies Anna. John Peter Zenger steps over to his son and puts his hands on the boy's shoulder. 
He smiles as if trying to calm the boy of his nervousness. Peter, get to school. You will study hard. He turns to Anna. We have to find Eloise. Anna knew that if her husband was going to leave the shop before inking the press, that he would not return before raising someone's ire. John Peter Zenker grabs his long, dark gray overcoat, pulls it on, and turns to the journeyman. If Mr. If Mr. Alexander or Mr. Smith arrive, stir their work in the compartment underneath my desk, says John Peter Zenker. I will, I will review it personally. Oh, I will, Johnny, replies the journeyman. What's happening? All rebels have roused, my friend. The journeyman watches John and Anna Zenger turn and exit the print shop. Never wise to piss off a publisher. There was a logic about what happened to you after a run-in with the Redcoats. Either you were in the hospital, the morgue, or jail. And regardless of which location, you were going to be in plenty of pain. It was these places the Zengers would look for Eloise Birch. Distant howls of pain echo from the operating room down the hall. The sound of a, a saw clattering to the floor echoes. Eloise groggily looks around at the post-operative ward where she lay with her ribs bandaged. The double doors swing open. And John and Anna John and Anna Zenger briskly enter while a nurse runs after them. The nurse tries to run in front of them, but they are determined to check the entire hospital if that is what it takes to reach their goal. Monsieur, Madame, are you family? asks the nurse. Only family may enter. Anna suddenly turns on the nurse as if warning her not to interfere. The nurse stops short and looks up more than a foot to see Anna looking back down at her. Rumor around town was that Anna came from a, from a proper family in Holland and had extremely refined manners. But when crossed, she certainly used her size and endurance to get the results she wanted. There was no way a nurse standing barely five feet tall was going to challenge a printer standing, let alone the printer's wife, standing well over six feet tall. So the nurse retreats back through the double doors, perhaps to get reinforcements, or just let the whole matter end right then and there. Anna turns to see that John has found Eloise toward the end of a long room, and she moves to stand on either side of the other side of the bed. Eloise, we heard what happened, says John Peter Zenger. Do you need anything? asks Anna. Eloise gasps in a slow breath. I need to see Paul. The sheriff took him away. Why did the sheriff arrest him? He said Paul was dealing in illegal merchandise, replies Eloise. Anna looks at John. Illegal merchandise? Any merchandise without the government revenue seal is illegal, replies John Peter Zenger as he begins thinking like one of his reporters. What was he selling? Rum. Imported rum. Paul would never deal in pirate merchandise, notes Anna. She'd been buying the family groceries from Paul's store for years and was never cheated by him in the quality of his goods or by the price charged for them. We didn't know, pleads Eloise. The, the seal appeared genuine. The distributor said it was reputable. We, we didn't know. John, you have to believe me. We didn't know the seal was a fake. John Peter Zenger nods and takes Eloise's hands. Of course we do. You need to relax, suggests Anna. I will go to the courthouse and find Paul, says John Peter Zenger as he looks up to Anna. Ask the doctor his fee. Have him bill it to the journal. I will. No, John, you cannot please Eloise further. How will I repay you? Do not fret, Eloise, offers Anna. We help our own. Rest easy, says John Peter Zenger with a confident smile. I must be off. Anna watches as John Peter Zenger marches out with his long, dark overcoat flowing behind him. Despite the sympathy she felt for Eloise, Anna could not help but smile at her husband's boldness. John did not even stand six feet tall. 
Yet his determination and sense of right belonged to a knight that, mu that might have stood eight feet tall and then some. Moments like this constantly reminded her why she'd have asked him to marry her if she had not asked him, if he had not asked her first. Chapter 4. The courthouse stands atop a story of brick and mortar steps on the corner of Wall and Nassau Streets. Crossing the cobblestone street, John Peter Zenger scales the steps two by two, he yanks open the heavy wooden doors, and briskly enters. Without bothering to show any identification or credentials to the red coat guard standing near the door, he heads down the hall to the left. One guard nods to the other and then follows John down the hall, through a door, and down the steps to the basement offices for a day with the process. As is typical, the minor magistrate in charge of handling civilian inquiries had John filling out forms as to why he was not at the courthouse making inquiry regarding something that was not even his business. In effort to work within the system, John filled out the forms and then waited and waited and waited as the quibbling little desk clerks got around to reading and categorizing his request forms and those of anyone else who happened to it happened in during the course of the day. Despite, despite being so low on the hierarchy, these little martinet clerks were quite smug and anal retentive in their adherence to a system that uh, only worked to frustrate those requesting anything of it. And then without a word, they just closed up at 5 p.m., leaving John and nearly a dozen others more than dissatisfied with the lack of service. The others frowned and departed, but John was not leaving without Paul Birch. The elderly jailer was, is scribing his reports of confession into a record book when the door erupts open and John Peter Zenger barges in, slams his ink-stained fist down on the desk, and stares him in the eye. A redcoat guard rushes in behind him, but just gets a hard stare from John, as if telling him that he'd be dealt with later. The jailer, of course, is not amused by the intrusion, but lacks the physical prowess to do a damn thing about it. Ah, oh, you cannot go in here without an appointment, snaps the redcoat. You know who I am, snaps John Peter Zenger. You know that I've been waiting since this morning. Now you will take me to verify the health of Paul David Birch. Do you have an appointment, asks the jailer. Grabbing the book, John turns it around and reads it rapidly down the entire page. Then he looks up at the jailer as if condemning him. This is Paul's testimony, isn't it? The jailer and the red coat are exchanging nervous glances, as if both know business as usual is about to change. John snaps a look at the red coat, then the jailer, then jabs his finger into the jailer's chest. Is it? Did he have advice of counsel? Are these words written by him? John Peter Zenger turns on the red coat, causing him to take a step back. Or did one of his kind beat these confessions out of him? The red coat made the mistake of grabbing Zenger's arm as if asserting authority that he alone lacked the prowess to support. Are you do not come in here making demands? Before the red coat can react, John winds his arm out of the red coat's grips and slams the heel of his hand into the redcoat's chest. The redcoat slams backwards into a stone wall, and before he can draw his pistol, John clamps his hand down onto the pistol into the holster. Take me to Paul David Birch, snaps John Peter's anger. Now! Startled, the redcoat swallows a knot in his young throat, maintains bladder control, and shrugs, okay. Without warning, a musket blast echo, echoes through the arched doorway. Before the echo dies out, John Peter Zenger is out the office with the young red coat and the jailer fast behind him. You! Who you are? <laughs> yeah! 
rises from the burning hair around the head wound. There at the mouth of the alley, near the courthouse, does Paul David Birch lay dead with a startled look on his face. Angrily does Sheriff John Symes yank a smoky musket from a red coat. His gloved hands and throws it to the street. You bloody idiot! Snaps John Symes as the, at the red coat as he gestures at the a dead merchant. That was unnecessary! He was running, lies the red coat. Sheriff John Symes coils back his closed fist and shakes it as if wanting to slap the young red coat repeatedly across the face with it. Ugh. After you shoved him, damn it! After you shoved him, he was running! The basement door swings open, and John Peter Senga runs into the alley and sees his neighbor laying sprawled on the cobblestones, dead. The jailer and the young red coat run out of the basement behind Zenger and can only shrug as if what happened had become all too routine to them. Dropping to one knee, John Peter Zenger examines the jagged hole shot in the back of Paul David Birch's head. By the size of the hole, the powder burns and the singed hair and the jagged shards of skull sent into the brain it was all too obvious that this execution had been carried out at close range. Likely just inches beyond the muzzle end of the musket. Disgusted, he looks back at the redcoats. Why? Seeing the musket in the street, John Peter Zenger then looks back to the one redcoat standing there with empty hands. He looks to Sheriff John Symes, who has a regretful, apologetic look on his face. Slowly, John Peter Zenger stands up, fists clenched, and approaches the sheriff. Damn you! I asked why! The unarmed redcoat is actually smug. He was killed trying to escape. He never knew the revenue seals were counterfeit. He never evaded your taxes. John Peter Zenger rapidly turns on the jailer. And where are his glasses? How could he have written, read, or signed the confession that he could not even see? He turns on the... On the Unarmed Redcoat advances. You killed Paul David Birch. He was unarmed, you coward. The unarmed Redcoat is still smug. So are you, Deutschlander. Looking around at the office and apartment windows above, John Peter Zenger sees the silhouettes of citizens staring down on him. He thought he was alone at the mouth of this alley. Yet now, there are witnesses. But they are, were only that, witnesses. They were not active or vocal. He looks to the sheriff with a bold grin on his face. Have you a bullet for every eye in the city that looks down upon you? The Redcoats can only watch John Peter Zenger slowly lift Birch and carry him down the center of Wall Street. The sheriff looks up at the windows to see the citizens watching, and there is nothing he can say or do to stop them. While this morning he was a citizen among the citizens, the shooting of Paul David Birch by one of his own soldiers caused a rift between they and the sheriff that might never heal. He knew he had little status among the British magistrates. He was but a tool to them to be used until no longer needed. 
and he would be looked upon as an enemy by his very own neighbors. And was there anything he could say or do to end that? Through the windows of the New York Weekly Journal, the journeyman watches the last rays of sunlight fade into an indigo darkness. He turns his attentions back to the cleaning of the excess ink from the presses while an apprentice sweeps the hardwood floor. A tall, thin, darkly just dressed gentleman, James Alexander, sits behind the bookshelves that serve as room dividers to Zenger's office and handwrites an article. The doorbells ring as the door opens and John Peter Zenger briskly enters, casting off his long coat over the back of a chair. Noticing his urgency, all of his employees put aside what they're doing and gather around at the center of the shop. Johnny, what kept you? asks the journeyman. We cannot print without your approval on the justice value didn't, says John Peter Zenger as he holds up both hands as if simulating the headline. No headline. Merchant murdered. Paul David Birch killed, in quotations, trying to escape. End quote. Funeral is 11 a.m. tomorrow. Gentlemen, I know you put in a full day, but know that I will pay double to any man who would work this night with me. The doorbells jingle as the doors open and Anna enters behind John. James Alexander steps out from behind the shelves holding his freshly written article. But be warned, one and all, that printing the truth has not been popular of late, says James Alexander in a tone that seems to challenge anyone to brave the worst. Any man concerned for the security of his family may decline without reprisal. To print the articles they intended means taking a stand against the cruelty of everyone from the lowest ranked redcoat up to the colonial governor himself. And yet everyone in the shop takes two steps toward John Peter Zenger as if accepting the inevitable risk. Putting his arm around Anna, John looks at the confident expressions of his crew. They are ready to weather any storm. Then let's get to work, says John Peter Zenger. I need a new page one, ready to print by middle night. Very noble your dedication, Johnny, but the writers have all gone home, notes the journeyman. Who'll write it? Mr. Alexander, I think I impose upon you this night. And I'll read the details and I shall have a draft complete by hour's end, replies James Alexander. Anna rolls up the ruffled sleeves of her blouse and I shall set the type. These are the times that test our metal, says John Peter Zenger. May we prove stronger than the oppressor's blade. As if breaking from a hollow. The journeyman and his apprentices rapidly go about cleaning the presses and preparing buckets of ink. John and Anga and Anna go with James Alexander past the bookshelves into the tiny office and explain the day's events while he makes note on a piece of paper. Chapter 5 Beyond the articles in the New York Weekly Journal, there is the whispered rumors of witnesses retelling stories of arrests, land and property confiscations, the revoking of voting rights, and numerous oppressive measures taken against the citizenry. Governor Cosby no doubt received news of these rumblings over the weeks and sent for additional troops to be dispatched to New York to provide him additional protection against an up a potential uprising. In answer to that request, a second warship Posts into the candlelit harbor, plunges its anchor, and sent dozens of redcoats ashore to augment the roving guard. Every business on Wall Street is closed and dark on this night in November, except the courthouse whose candles never ceased to burn. Carrying a lantern, a lanky middle-aged man takes a stalk of wood, holds it into the lantern to catch the flame, and then leans up to place the flame into the wick inside the wrought iron and glass street lamp. The street lamp illuminates and reveals two well-dressed New Yorkers 
a Jerseyite, and James Alexander. These men stand beside the courthouse, speaking in low tones. He acts without concern for the wrongs he does, this Governor Cosby. This is the first New Yorker as he eyes the lanky man heading down the block to the next lamp. Dismissing judges whose decisions do not liken to his own, as the second New Yorker as he pulls his gloves on, erecting his courts without consent of legislature. James Alexander is making mental note of everything said, as he knew it unsafe to write anything that might be seen in public. And confiscating lands, deeds, and voting rights of those who will not swear to his oaths. True enough, attests the second New Yorker. Why, only months ago did 37 Quakers have their voting rights challenged when they could not swear but only affirm to their status as landowners and freeholders. Quite a malevolent puppet is this Governor Grex the Jerseyite, striking down so many in the name of the king. I doubt it was... King George, who commanded the prosecution of Governor Rip Van Dam, conjecture, conjectures the first New Yorker. Or the removal of Chief Justice Lewis Morris from his court, as the second New Yorker as he looks cautiously left and right. One wonders if the Crown knows what their Governor Cosby does, and with so much impunity. Or how much bilge pours from the Crown's ships into our harbors, remarks James Alexander as he glances down the block to see a squad of redcoats marching by. The second New Yorker appears tired. We brave the North Atlantic seeking freedom only to find rougher shores here. The Jerseyite sports an uh, ironic smile. If you gentlemen find New York so unfavorable, then cross the river. Land is plentiful in New Jersey. That, sir, would be like jumping from frying pan into fire, scoffs James Alexander. Aye, Governor Cosby rules in New Jersey with all of the reach and grasp of an octopus, grumbles the second New Yorker. Looking up the courthouse steps, James Alexander sees two winged barristers walking down, conversing and chuckling openly. They pass by, taking no notice of the four disgruntled colonists. Ah, how we dare not speak indoors, says James Alexander, even in a house where debate and open forum is the way. The first New Yorker speaks in low tones and eyes the many candles burning in one court window in particular. The star chambers are now in session, Mr. Alexander, and their eyes, their ears are everywhere. They look about to see a passenger, passerby eye them suspiciously, and then walk on. Had the man heard anything they said? Was he just a curious citizen who thought it strange that four men would assemble in public? Or was he one of the eyes, the ears, that Governor Cosby also requested to keep him advised of the public's disfavor? Such were the thoughts that trouble in your head when you walk the streets nowadays. Always someone unseen, seeing and hearing and reporting you. But while the Jerseyite and the New Yorkers hushed themselves, James Alexander could only smile as he watched the passerby turn in the next block. Gentlemen, the time has come to offend their senses. Sunlight shines through the windows of the New York Weekly Journal and strikes page ones draped over the clotheslines. Carefully does a teenaged apprentice remove the page ones and take them along the tables toward the rear of the shop to be joined with the rest of the week's paper. Nearby, the journeyman lines up type blocks to create an advertisement for horse-drawn carriages. Sitting in his tiny office behind the tall bookshelves, John Peter Zenger 
sips his black coffee and reads a handwritten draft while James Alexander waits for his reaction. Because of the often inflammatory nature of his articles, James Alexander rarely could sign his articles and his only sense of accomplishment came from the Zenger family's reactions of the first read. I like this reference to jumping from frying pan to fire. Very... What is the English word I am looking for? Metaphorical, offers James Alexander. Yes, yeah. To compare politics to cooking, chuckles Zenger. Most incendiary. Today does the governor learn the stick of our metal. Chapter 6. When not entertaining his weekly guests in his dining room, Governor Cosby would take his dinner in the study alone. He preferred the company of those who ingratiated for his, atten his attentions to his own silent company. His solitude in this, the governor's mansion, was horrendous. Beyond the staff that ran the estate, there was not a soul at this hour. Beyond the staff that ran the estate, not a sound. And because of his station, Governor Cosby never took to socializing with that staff, lest it make them familiar with him. And he would not stand for that. Yet if he did anything, he never hesitated to bellow. This night did he sit dining on a steak, drinking red wine, and reading the latest edition of the New York Weekly Journal. A few words caused his throat to constrict. <sighs> from, from frying pan into fire, did Governor Cosby read with a sneer. He went into a fit, crushed his crystal glass in his hand, and lacerated his palm. Red wine and blood splatter across the journal. And the governor howls, Harrison! From the next room, a butler can be heard running for his coat. Before the governor's voice echoes away, the rear door of the mansion had opened and closed, and the butler was on his way to task a lower-ranked servant to fetch Francis Harrison. The next day, Two winged barristers stand on the courthouse steps. One holds the New York Weekly Journal, folded. The other holds the Gazette, wide open for anyone to see. Along the street is the morning traffic of persons walking to work but conversing in low tones. As they pass the courthouse, the first barrister reads from his New York Weekly Journal, to which he says most bluntly that would be like jumping from frying pan into the fire. I prefer Mr. Bradford's New York Gazette, says the second barrister as he gestures to an article. Well, why so? The barrister smiles. My friend. One can read the New York Gazette inside the courthouse where it is warm. Francis Harrison, briefcase in hand, rushes past the two barristers and ascends the courthouse steps. He is through the door without raising so much as a glance at, at, from the armed guards. The barristers are amused. Francis Harrison, a little man who moves with considerable purpose, notes the second barrister with a chuckle. The first barrister smirks. No surprise the Gazette is acceptable in court when young Mr. Harrison ghosts it. In the courtroom, Judge James Delancey, age 32, and his slightly elder associate justice, Judge Frederick Phillips, stand near the windows and confer over a red wine and dry blood-stained copy of the New York Weekly Journal. They had been handed this copy as evidence of their governor's displeasure. This is not the first occurrence to raise the governor's ire, remarks Judge Phillips. He wants an end put to such hostile rubbish. 
Zinger only printed what anonymous rogues generated, notes James, Judge James Delancey as he glanced at the journal. If anything, we should make effort to learn their identities and prosecute them. Right, observes Judge Phillips. End the cause and the effects end with it. The heavy oak doors swing open and Francis Harrison barges in, hurls his cloak over the back of a chair, opens his case, and pulls out a fresh ink set of legal documents. The judges exchange glances as if entertained by Harrison's youthful vigor and then continue their conversation. But under what charge do we arrest Zenger for? asks Judge Delancey, full knowing what Harrison was itching to provide in the way of an answer. <laughs> Seditious libel, your honors, blurts uh, Francis Harrison. He hands forth documents, fresh with the governor's signature and official seals. We did wonder when you would have something to add, Mr. Harrison, says Judge Delancey. For you are the governor's conduit. Smug, Francis Harrison throws his nose up. He's conduit, his voice, and his ears. And what results might the governor find favorable? Asks Judge Phillips in a patronizing manner. Only that those of political opposition are silenced, replies Francis Harrison. Judge Delancey holds out his hand. And you have a list of these opponents? Francis Harrison pulls a list from his case, which he hands to Judge Delancey. To his surprise, Judge Phillips snatches a list and looks over it with an amused expression on his face. Francis Harrison continues to take himself damn too seriously. This is a list of suspects. Choose a reliable prosecutor and task him with questioning Zenger for who else is writing these libels. Your case would have more weight with Zenger's confession, offers Judge Delancey, implying that Harrison should have done a little more homework. But these idealists are not quick to turn over their own, adds Judge Phillips. Francis Harrison tries putting two, to, putting two plus two together before opening his mouth again. You imply that these idealists infected Zenger with their rhetoric. Use your art with the system. Test Zenger's resolve with high bail and confinement. The sheriff will be given warrant before another issue is published, says Judge Delancey. The governor thanks you and wishes you know what favor he holds you in, spouts Governor Harrison as if he rehearsed this speech too damn many times already. God save the king and good day to your honors. With a nod, Francis Harrison turns, sweeps up his cloak, and briskly as it is. The judges look as if they're trying to keep from laughing. They exchange glances and shake their heads. Harrison is a little fish snipping bits of meat from the teeth of a shark, remarks Judge Phillips. Judge Delancey sighs. Oh, but for how long does the shark tolerate the little fish? End part one.